2016, there's been much discussion of how does the poli how do electoral politics fit in with underlying economic trends, the topic, of course, of our, much of our discussion yesterday, uh, and how do they fit in with deep-seated cultural and social prejudices. And therefore, there's a, emerged two competing narratives, two competing narratives, one focusing on the first of these variables, the variables that uh, most of our panelists were discussing yesterday, and the second focusing on the variables that many people in the establishment on both sides of the Atlantic are focusing on. In other words, the political leaders, the economic leaders, certainly the media, and even some of the academic leaders are focusing on the explanation for the Trump phenomenon, for the Brexit phenomenon, for the alternative for Deutschland phenomenon. They're focusing on the explanation, well, this is a result of deep-seated cultural and social values, uh, but they will gradually wither away, or dare we say, die off. And the alternative nar narrative that one could develop already from hearing what we heard yesterday, the alternative narrative is actually there are very serious economic realities that explain the votes in the apparently three quite different countries of the United States, Britain, and Germany. Uh, and those, uh, those, uh, that alternative explanation uh, uh, was pretty much presented in the economic forum yesterday. Shannon and her wonderful comments yesterday began to refract that into the political uh, phenomenon. And our panel today is going to try to translate the underlying economic realities, the competing explanation on social and cultural variables into actual political behavior of the three major industrial countries in the once Western world. And that will be a presentation on Germany. We'll begin with that. Then on uh, Britain, excuse me, we'll begin with the presentation on Britain, uh, then on, uh, on uh, Germany, and, and then on uh, the United States. And to lead off, we're going to be having a presentation by Thomas Fetzer of the University of Warwick, uh, Timo Fetzer, University of Warwick, uh, and also associated with the Center for Competitive Advantage in the Global Economy. And incidentally, the institutional affiliations, and particularly the institute affiliations of our panelists perfectly uh, embody the uh, focus on the global economy, but they have moved beyond merely that and are looking at the political consequences. And we're going to hear very rich, dense presentations. For those of you who have had an opportunity who have seen uh, the papers on the, uh, on the INET uh, website, you will see these are highly professional po papers on a highly politicized topic. And so now let's begin there with Timo Fetza. And your presentation will be, uh, uh, as I recall, will be who voted for Brexit? A comprehensive district level analysis. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's, oh, it's okay to stand up, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, the title is slightly different, but, uh, you know, it is uh, uh, about Brexit. So if I change it towards paths to Brexit, shedding light on common factors, driving anti-EU preferences. Um, and I guess sort of the big question here is whether we can think of Brexit as just being a symptom of uh, a wider disease, because across the EU we do see growing vote shares for uh, populist parties campaigning on explicitly anti-EU uh, platforms. Which then brings us to the question whether um, the European globalization experiment is under serious threat from within. And that also raises the question, you know, what are the common factors, what are the different uh, differences that arise when we, when we, you know, through the lens of looking at Brexit, uh, extend our view uh, to other countries in, in the EU. So what I'm going to do is take you on a journey from, from the UK to France and the rest of the EU, um, where in the first instance I'm going to look at what are the correlates of Brexit, um, and uh, then we're going to look through these correlates of Brexit at Le Pen voting in France, and we'll see that a common uh, theme uh, emerges. And then I'm going to briefly uh, uh, present uh, some evidence on some longer running uh, trends that are associated with growing voter polarization uh, uh, around the issue uh, of EU membership across uh, several European countries, drawing on a large data set of, uh, 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 from uh, over the last 40 years. 
because fundamentally we want to understand you know, what explains the emergence of populist politics. So this is a map that you probably all have seen in various different color, color uh, shades. Um, as you see, this is plotting out the vote leave share across uh, local government areas, or we, we refer to them as districts, across the UK, with green areas being ones that had a leave majority, whereas purple areas are those that have a remain a majority. And what uh, I and my co-authors did after um, the referendum was actually assemble a very comprehensive data set that tells us, you know, for every district, you know, a large uh, a set of characteristics that seem to describe the economic and social realities um, of uh, um, this uh, uh, of each uh, district. And we then did a post-mortem by regression, so to say. Um, um, and it turns out that very simple empirical models that draw just several uh, uh, variables uh, from um, this uh, large database explain the distribution of the vote leave share across the UK extremely well. So what I'm plotting out here on the horizontal axis, you can see um, the actual vote leave share, um, and on the vertical axis I'm plotting out fitted values that are obtained from a regression with uh, 19 variables. Uh, I'll speak more about what these variables are in a second, but as we see, um, you know, if there was a perfect fit, these things would align perfectly on the 45 degree line, this orange, orange line. And as you can see, the actual values and the fitted values are extremely clustered around that 45 degree line, which basically means that a simple model with just a few covariates can actually capture the systematic variation in the distribution of the leaf share across uh, um, the UK. So, you know, what are these variables? First of all, you know, how did we arrive at, for example, these 19 variables here? Um, as I said, my co-authors and I, we assembled a large data set that captures various aspects uh, um, uh, at the local uh, level. And then we use a simple machine learning method um, to actually pick the set of covariates that robustly, that are robustly associated together in explaining um, the vote uh, leave share, in particular, the purpose here is to build a model that we can use to do out-of-sample prediction. So we actually say, okay, with this vector of covariates at hand, could we have predicted um, um, the referendum uh, result? The method that we use is called best subset selection, but I'm not going to bore you uh, uh, with the details and jump sort of straight to uh, the main uh, uh, result, um, which can be summarized in a rather simple uh, bar chart. So we have here... Um, and so the first column here is telling us about the quality, the goodness of the fit. If we were to just do this machine learning best subset selection on this large vector of covariates, not really looking at it in a, in a super systematic way. And as you can see here, we can push up the predictive accuracy um, up to 95%, which basically means that it's an even tighter fit around uh, uh, around that 45 degree line than what I presented uh, uh, in the previous uh, figure. Now, what we then did is to actually categorize this large vector of variables, which is about you know, up to 150 different uh, characteristics, which is obviously a challenge because we have only 380 observations for uh, you know, official uh, counting areas in, in, in the UK for the referendum result. And what we see is that actually, if we do this sort of systematically subdividing the variables that capture various things, such as you know, a local area's exposure to the European Union, we actually see that this set of variables actually has the best model that we can build to predict the leaf share um, actually um, you know, does a pretty poor job. And these are variables such as an area's direct EU trade exposure, its dependence, on, on trade with the European Union, its receipts of European structural funds, the extent to which they benefit from transfers from Brussels, various things like migrant levels and changes over time, uh, um, you know, to capture migration from the European Union, and things like historic anti-EU preferences captured by the 1975 referendum vote. So we see that this set of variables does not seem to predict the vote leave share. I mean, it does predict to some level, but it doesn't do as great a job as we had, you know, as popular sort of discourse would have, uh, you know, uh, induced us to believe. The second set of variable captures things such as public sector, you know, 
spending cuts, which were obviously very prominent across the UK. Austerity following the financial crisis hit millions of households across the UK. So we have a set of variables that capture things like public sector uh, uh, employment cuts, benefit cuts, various dimensions of the benefit cuts, housing market indicators, the tightness of sort of uh, uh, the housing market, as well as uh, measures such as the performance of the NHS in delivering, you know, waiting time targets in a local area. And there we do slightly better, but again, we're, you know, quite surprised that you know, the pub public debate, which all was around, oh, let's fund the NHS instead, rather than sending money to Brussels. You know, this set of variables, the best model that we can build out of this does actually not do a very great job in uh, uh, capturing the variation in the lease share across, uh, uh, across the UK. The, by far, the, the, the most relevant variables are to be found in things that are slow moving, that have evolved over a long time period, such as demography in an area, um, you know, high or low levels of educational attainment, inequality within a local area in life satisfaction, um, and manufacturing sector, construction sector, various employment shares and structural, you know, changes within these employment shares over time. So by far, these two bar charts combined, so the last two columns combined, basically uh, uh, give us an extremely well uh, uh, model that captures most of the variation in the Brexit vote. So what this suggests is that we have these slow-moving socioeconomic fundamentals that seem to be key to understand the leaf vote, either by themselves or by their interaction with time-varying other uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, developments. Now, this is the part on the UK. So we have Brexit being explained by these slow-moving uh, uh, um, slow socioeconomic characteristics at the local level. The question now that, that we asked ourselves is, do we do a good job at doing out of sample prediction? Okay, so can we take a model that's been trained on the UK data to explain variation in the leaf share across areas in the UK? Can we use this model, the coefficients that we estimate, to actually predict Le Pen voting in France? So we take our coefficients and we take X variables from France to translate these coefficients into uh, uh, Le Pen uh, voting. And to cut a long story short, yes, we do capture similar variation. Uh, in fact, you know, our best model captures about 50% of the variation that the best French model with this set of variables that we have for France could explain, which suggests that there's something common to the UK and uh, to France, um, uh, you know, turning from populist voting to, uh, uh, to Brexit voting. There's something going on that seems to be connected uh, connecting the Le Pen vote and the Brexit vote um, 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 in these two uh, countries. Now, at some level, this also leaves us with a puzzle because, you know, maybe Brexit and Le Pen, you know, this is something that happened, you know, around the same time. Maybe this was just an odd year. So this could just be a short-run phenomena. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, while well, we see that these poor fundamentals, like bad demography, bad you know, economic structure, are strong correlates of uh, uh, Brexit voting and Le Pen voting, um, you know, there's this sort of disconnect between the narratives around the referendum and the uh, French elections that, you know, with, uh, uh, with the actual variables that do seem to capture most of the variation in the actual outcomes. So what I want to do now is to actually just look back in time across the EU to see whether, you know, looking at periods before the populist parties even existed in its current form, whether there have been trends towards polarization of voters with regard to uh, the European, uh, sort of, European topics, so to say, and whether these evolution of preference have, have evolved along well-defined social fault lines. The reason why I think this is important for this discussion is because if we know that one group in society has become more polarized uh, with regard to their preferences of EU membership, this opens up the door for political entrepreneurs to enter in the political marketplace. And these political entrepreneurs might as well be the populist parties that then drive the agenda, well before we actually see them performing at all in any elections. So I'm gonna skip this because it's a bit technical, but basically what I'm looking at is a huge data set of around one million Europeans over the last 40 years 
uh, for, uh, uh, for about 10 different countries, so France, UK, Germany, Italy, and so on, the, the core member countries. And we're looking at to what extent our left-hand side, which measures you know, pro-EU or anti-EU preferences, is correlated over time with socioeconomic characteristics. And each time, I'm removing the potential confounding effects of a large vector of other socioeconomic characteristics. So I'm generally capturing a trend that's specific to a socioeconomic characteristics that might be capturing a socioeconomic divide. And this is, you know, uh, 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 it's going to boil down to a bunch of graphs uh, like this. So if we think about the labor market divide at the top end, we have executive management positions. At the bottom end, we have manual workers. And as you see uh, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, on the left panel, is manual workers have been less pro-European, but they have been consistently less pro-European um, across the last 40 years. And the same thing for executive or management positions at the upper end of the labor market divide, they have been consistently more pro-European. So it does not seem to be that the preferences uh, have evolved in any sort of linear or non-linear way systematically across the labor market divide. Let's look at the rural-urban divide, which is also something that came up in the Brexit vote and also is relevant to France. And there we do see a trend. People living in large cities used to be Eurosceptics, and now they become Europhiles. Whereas people in rural areas used to be more pro-European and they seem to have trended towards a less pro-European uh, attitude, which suggests a clear development along this social, socioeconomic divide. Let's look at the demographic divide, which is one of the variables that I mentioned is key to explaining the pattern across the UK in Brexit voting. And here we look at youth and pensioners and uh, 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 relative to those middle aged between 30 and 60, and we actually see something that's quite puzzling across the EU, that both over time, young people and old people seem to have become more pro-European relative to those that are aged between 30 and 60. So Euroscepticism is something that's actually captured between those aged between 30 and 60 when it comes to studying Euroscepticism across the EU. Lastly, looking at educational attainment, again, a key correlate of Brexit. It explains by itself around 65% of the variation in the Brexit vote. And here, this is again uh, quite telling because uh, when we turn to, or at some level thought-provoking, when we look at low, those with low educational attainment, we actually see it reasonably flat over time. They are less pro-European, but they you know, continue to be and, and have been consistently less European. Whereas if we look at the highly educated, there's a dramatic trend um, um, of you know, highly educated people becoming more and more pro-European. So there's a clear development and changes in political preferences along the educational attainment divide. And last but not least, and this is something that probably in some form or the other we've seen already, is the political divide. So left-leaning versus right-leaning uh, 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 individuals. And, and uh, this is, again, relative to those who classify as being in the center. And we see here that there's a reversal. Eurosceptics used to be on the left side of the political spectrum. These are the Corbynites. You know, Corbyn being uh, uh, sort of anti-European uh, sort of in, in the past and sort of being at least shaky on the, on the topic. Uh, whereas Euroscepticism nowadays is right-leaning, whereas before it was uh, uh, associated uh, with Euro, uh, you know, Euro, you know, positive attitudes towards EU. So just to summarize, while I think you know, there appear to be common factors that connect what is happening in France, the, the UK, Germany, across the, uh, across the EU, we see that there are clear developments uh, along these very clear socioeconomic fault lines which might explain why populist parties come about, why we start seeing them performing in elections, because the socioeconomic developments along these fault lines create very clear target audiences which allow for market entry in this populist, uh, in this political marketplace. Thank you very much. I think that's an excellent presentation to begin our panel. Uh, for We noticed that uh, Timo had made this into a cross-country comparison, and in addition, a cross-time comparison. And that also, in the course of it, uh, by teasing out various variables and the relative strength of them, he provides a model that could, one could imagine being applied to other countries in the future. Now we turn to our next uh, pa uh, paper, which is on Germany, uh, and our presentations will be given by Rob 
Robert Gold and by Stephen Heblock, Robert Gold of the Keogh Institute of uh, the World Economy. And the title of that paper is Instrumental Variables uh, and Causal Mechanisms Unpacking the Effect on tr of Trade on Workers. Yes, Robert. All right, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for having this paper on this uh, very interesting panel. This is joint work with Robert on the panel here and with Kristen Dippel and Rodrigo Pinto, both from UCLA. Um, the title is a little bit technical and the paper has some technical elements. I will boil it down to some more um, common insights here given the restriction in time. So let me start with a general introduction of the, of the idea of the paper. When we talk about globalization, one thing that comes to our mind and one thing that we want to focus on is essentially changes in the patterns of trade. And one thing that was very pronounced over the last years was the, the rise of China as a main producer in the world, which meant essentially that um, high-wage countries out of a sudden got a relative disadvantage in manufacturing production, and we see increasing penetration of their labor markets, and especially the you know, lower skilled workers in these markets from um, import competition with China. Right? So this is kind of an overall change in the pattern of trade that happened over the last 30 years, and which served as a motivation for a lot of research, and I will come back to that. What we want to look at is that some of the media have assumed that these changes in the labor market might be related to what Timo just talked us about, about, um, about Brexit, about you know, presidents in the US being elected, but it's not focused on particular countries. We have a wide set of countries. We have the US, we have the Netherlands, we have Brexit here in Britain, we have France, and we have also the example of Germany. Okay? So all these new challenges, um, we believe, might be um, the, the whole rise of globalization might be related to new challenges in the political arena, and we would like to focus on this. What we are looking at is specifically Germany. When we talk about Germany, globalization has two faces. On the one hand, we have the rise of trade, for instance, with China, but also, since Germany is closely related to Eastern Europe, we also have a whole hinterland of uh, cheaper labor production in Eastern Europe, so we call it jointly the East, which on the one hand, increased competition from these countries, but there was also opportunities. Germany became a large exporter to these countries, and we should expect that the labor markets in Germany who are exporting to these places also face some opportunities. And you see this pretty nicely in these trends here for, for Germany. If we think about the period, so we're looking basically at a period of almost 20 years, 22 years. Over this time, you had two shocks, basically, which, um, which we roughly think of as globalization. The first shock was the fall of the Iron Curtain in, the, in around 1990, which opened up the Eastern European labor market, mostly China was already rising at that time, but really the shock from China kicked in in around 2001 when China um, joined the WTO, and we out of a sudden saw that there was much more um, trade happening with China. So we exploit these two shocks in two periods, and we try to understand how this increase in overall trade for German region, how this affected the political arena. In order to create a measure that, that uh, measures trade exposure across German regions for both periods, we apply um, a methodology that was introduced by other authors, but the idea is simply to think of national import and export shares from and to Germany, and we apportion them to regions based on industry level employment, right? So we have, um, we break the overall uh, trade flows down by industry level and then we assign them relative to the proportions of, of employment in these regions. What you then get is you get these two patterns for the first and for the second period. Darker areas will always um, refer to regions that are more affected. I want to point to two regions which um, have been affected in both areas and which are sometimes subject to discussion in, the, in media outlets. This is um, the Southwest Palatine area. It was a leather production area which uh, suffered heavily from, from the exposure to trade. Then you have this area here in, um, in Bavaria at the border to the Czech Republic. And again, this was also an area that suffered quite heavily from, from globalization and from, um, from competition with lower wage countries. And at the same time, we also see some instances that these were places where, where in the popular media you saw some reports about uh, right-wing activities rising in these papers. So this is, there's like, apparently there is some relationship and we would try to understand this relationship in more detail in our paper, okay? So this is as a motivation. Um, if you then look, and I do not want to go into the details about how we're estimating these effects. I think this is uh, beyond a 15 minute presentation. What we do is here, we roughly, we regress essentially um, the outcome, the vote shares for different parties in national elections in Germany on this trade exposure measure 
Since the trade exposure measure might be endogenous, we, in, we imply an instrumental variable strategy that makes sure that we're really looking at trade exposure that is, um, that is not driven by demand effects in Germany that might correlate with political attitudes. What we're then interested in is we're looking at the vote, like we have here a turnout, and then we have like the political party spectrum in Germany, which is not just two parties, so it's important to keep in the back of your mind. We're not in the US setting with only two parties. We have a very wide spectrum of parties, and we slice this up into, into, into bands of uh, political intentions, and we, we have the main parties, which is the CDU, CSU, the conservatives. We then have this SPD, which is the social democrats. We have the FDP, which are the liberals, and the Greens, it's kind of like an ecological party. And then we have, at the fringes, we group, and this is for the German context, keep again in the back of your mind, we did not have something like the AFD, the Alternative for Germany, like um, a populist right party in our period. These are really hardcore Nazi type parties that we're having on the right end, and we have the far left spectrum, which um, could be an alternative, um, benefit, or they could alternatively benefit from, from any um, globalization threats, right? So we wanna look at those, uh, those both party spectrums. We can distinguish them nicely in a German context. And what we find is that to us, at the beginning a bit counterintuitively, the left didn't capture any of the globalization votes. So initially we were thinking if people are afraid of globalization, maybe you just want to demand more, um, more redistribution and maybe you would vote for the left, but indeed instead it was the right. And once we looked a little bit more into the literature, there was a quite a clear explanation for this effect because essentially the left was for global redistribution. They wanted to help everyone who's being a loser of globalization, not just nationally, but internationally. Whereas in the context of the far right, they said we have similar goals. We want to help the losers of the globalization, but not internationally. We don't care about the people who suffer from bad working conditions. We want to help our workers at home. And this was their nationalist agenda, and apparently this was more attractive to people. And which we see, in terms of magnitude, I give you an idea about the effect in the moment, but this is basically, you see here, a positive effect. So if you have a one standard deviation increase in trade exposure, which we could think of as a 1,350 euro exposure per worker in terms of um, import competition, right? This leads to about a 0.12 percentage point rise in the share of, in, in the share of right votes, which is about 28% of the overall increase of their vote share over the whole period, right? If we then do a little bit more of a detailed analysis and if we do not just look at the overall vote shares, but if we go to the individual level where we can also look at types of workers, we find that this effect is mostly driven by low-skilled workers in manufacturing, which is kind of the group that we have in our minds when we think about who voted for, for different extremist parties, okay? Now, the interesting question is now what is driving this? And I said at the beginning, the media seem to speculate that this effect is driven by labor market turmoil, and we want to causally nail this down. This is part of our empirical strategy and a part of the contribution of the paper. I will not have time to explain this in detail, but let me start with some motivating stuff. Let me tell you first about the local labor market effects. This is research that has been done for the US. This is research that has been done for Germany. In all this research, it is typically found that there is a strong negative effect of increasing trade exposure on manufacturing employment. There was this um, the China syndrome effect for America, which was uh, very popular in 2013. A similar paper has been written by Fint Eisen and Zutikow and Zutikum for, for the case of Germany. The slight difference between America and Germany is that Germany did not just, um, was not just hit by increasing trade exposure, but they also had new benefits and they had new opportunities to export to low wage countries, in this case specifically China, which also helps some regions. So you have basically both ends of the spectrum. You have regions that benefit and you have regions that lose out from globalization. We confirm their effects, so up here you see basically a negative effect of, the, of increasing trade exposure on the share of manufacturing employment. This is a confirmation of what we find in the literature, but for our purpose, we're not interested in the entirety, but we basically try to boil all these labor market effects down into two principal components. One of these principal components is then capturing the overall manufacturing effect of globalization, okay? So we're basically just running a factor analy analysis on all these labor market variables, and we get two factors out. One of them is clearly indicating that we're looking at labor market effects um, in, in manufacturing, okay? Now, the idea then is, 
to move basically from a model where we started and said we have trade exposure, so this is this little T here, which has an effect on voting, right? And this is the coefficient that I just reported in the table. Again, a one standard deviation increase in trade exposure, keep in the back of your mind, 1,350 euros roughly in 2,005 euros, um, increases the right wing vote share by one, uh, 0 0.12 percentage points roughly, right? What we then want to do is we want to break this total effect up into the effect that is driven by the labor market or mediated by the labor market. In order to do that, we come up with an you know, with a methodological contribution, how we could identify causally this mediation effect. Again, it's too much to explain here, but what we find, and this is quite an interesting finding, is we find now that the mediated effect, the indirect effect that goes through the labor market, is actually 80% larger than the total effect. So we see that once we look at the effect that goes through the labor market, and through labor market turmoil, we find that a one standard deviation in trade exposure now leads to an increase in right-wing votes by about 0.21 percentage points, right? Which at the same time means if we have this even stronger indirect effect, we might, this must mean that on the other hand, the direct effect from trade on labor markets must be moderating or must basically be lower in order to get to this total average effect, right? So as a conclusion of the paper, we find that trade shocks causally affect voting behavior. This is the first thing I say to you. Trade shocks exclusively affect the right fringe parties in Germany, but we believe that this finding is not restricted to Germany, right? We have now enough evidence to see that this, is, uh, this seems to be true for other cases, for other countries around the world. The right fringe parties gain um, from increasing import competition, but we can also show that if we break things down into import competition and export opportunities, we see that at the same time, better export opportunities also have a moderating effect on vote shares for right-wing parties, right? So it's kind of good news, depending on in which direction you go, you see that, that things move in the direction you would like them to see to move. And we can show that the effect is primarily driven by low-skilled workers in manufacturing. In terms of labor market adjustments, we find that trade causes labor market turmoil. This labor market turmoil then leads to radicalized voters, and we see that the total effect is smaller than the mediated effect that goes through the labor market. Let me finish this by a discovery that I just made yesterday. I recognize that the most recent economist is just picking up the same topic. It's looking at the ones who are left behind from globalization and reading over the articles in The Economist, which was more about also regional exposure and how we can help the regions that were left behind, there's one sentence which says, perhaps most of all politicians need a different mindset, which reminded me very much of reawakening and of the topic of this conference, and it's then going on, you can read it yourself, right? But this is, um, I think, a nice way to relate our topic to this overall topic of the conference, and I want to thank the organizers again for the opportunity to present here. I made up some time that Timo used up <laughs> before. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. And now we'll turn to Stephen Heblick, who will, from the University of Bristol, who will also be making an exposition of this particular uh, paper. Or, or are you, uh, Robert, you're not, you won't be, uh, like, good, okay. Then we will move directly uh, to the United States. Uh, and we will have a paper by Thomas Ferguson of INET and Benjamin Page of Northwestern University. Uh, and their paper, of course, as you can see, is The Hinge of Fate, Economic and Social Populism in the 2016 Presidential Election. Thomas? Okay, hi. Um, I guess everybody can understand why understanding the Trump phenomenon might be interesting and important. Uh, and I, I would like, however, to just begin with a general preface. You can, it will become perfectly obvious where Ben and I are coming from. But in the context of this panel, I hope you can see how, if you like, the, the sum of the parts uh, makes an impressive whole. That is to say, if you read the, the Times, the New York Times, the London Times, the Financial Times, the Washington Post, foreign policy, foreign affairs, whatever, you have been reading mostly with very little variation until recently for three, four, or five years that populism is all about culture and cultural reactions. You are learning today that that's fake news. 
um, that there is in fact a deep economic set of uh, factors at work here. And you know, Ben and I knew this work. I mean, that's why I'm the research director and I, I read them all. Um, but we thought it was time somebody had to tackle the American case. Now, tackling the American case is not so easy uh, because, uh, well, lots and lots of people were in, uh, um, it's, I think, post-traumatic stress, frankly, uh, after the election. And there was a kind of convulsive reaction as to everybody had theories of what was going on. It, was, I, I, it, it brought to mind the old Sam Goldwyn remark uh, when I heard this stuff where he said, you know, only one person in a thousand understands this thing and I seem to meet him every day. Uh, okay, so uh, we thought we would actually like to try going into the American National Election Surveys, which are said to be the gold standard. We will not argue about the medal right now, but they're certainly better than anything else. They're better than the newspaper polls that you see. Those often end up being quite unrepresentative and I gotta reweight them to get going. Now, we were hoping to do uh, a little more than we could do because we, we all agree that place is important. We read Shannon's work. I think I called her three days after her paper appeared in the, a little paper appeared in the Washington Post. That place really matters uh, in there. And so if you think about this for a second, if you've got a nationally representative survey, uh, trying to contextualize that is not easy because they're, they're being picked from all over. And the part of the problem is you, in many cases you've trouble figuring out where even the town is. People are protecting people's identities. The result is, is that what we haven't been able to do thus far is the type of analysis that these gentlemen have all been doing where you look at if how like longer term trends uh, fit into what just happened because we, we know we have to contextualize it. Uh, in, I mean, in particular, let me just caution you against, it's very obvious that what your current income is is probably not nearly as relevant as it used to be if you're living in a region which is plainly declining. And you've got to find a way to get at that variable over time. Anyway, uh, so what we have been doing is therefore partial. Um, all, my, all the yellow flags, but uh, it's, the stuff's just opened. Um, we can't assess the role of long-term stagnation yet. Um, there is this problem too, which is, you know, if you're at all familiar with political science, for better or perhaps for worse, um, you know that there are long running controversies in the role of issues versus party identifications versus ideology, meaning simply this. Um, there are some folks who seem to think that ideology or, and or especially party identifications are virtually inherited. That got to be a position that was very famous after the New Deal. Um, then it turned out, you know, by the 1960s, the correlation between kids and parents, because that was the traditional means of the transmission of that idea, it's turned out to be zero. I mean, literally zero. So people had to realize you couldn't just be sort of inheriting party ID, but the role of issues in that has been endlessly controverted. Um, now, everybody on this panel, they're really good statisticians, will realize mm, that's some kind of endogeneity there. Um, and at best, but instrumental variables, you know, I have the usual appeal, good instrumental variables are hard to find. Um, it's, this is sort of um, Theseus and the labyrinth. Uh, and nobody, I think, has quite, you got, we know where the bull is, but we're not sure how to get in or get out of it. So we, we will have to, we are going to try to sort of uh, navigate around that. Now, one possibility that uh, I'm going to jump ahead to one thing here, the very last. Um, one possibility that we were concerned about was claims made all over the place that what we had, it was a convulsive reaction on race to the election of the first black president. You know that? You, there were, I think everybody knows somebody or someplace um, that um, has obviously had a convulsive reaction. This isn't crazy. Anyway, so what we tried to do was use the uh, racial resentment scales 
in the National Election Survey, and you can see the results there, uh, which is basically there is a, the overall uh, U.S. voter mean for these elections does go a little bit further, a higher scores more racially resent, but then it drifts back in 2016. The party differences do open up, but the, you know, the story that you've got a huge uh, gigantic reaction is not easy to fit. Now, there are other measures of this using so-called implicit uh, approaches rather than the, the scales people use. It turns out those don't usually work very well in actually predicting anything. Uh, and so um, we, we're, we're not inclined to ex uh, accept that. Now, let me come back I, very quickly and I'm gonna hand this thing over to Ben in a little over two minutes. Uh, the, uh, you got one thing you have to understand uh, is the, uh, the difference between the primary and the general elections. And what we're concerned about here is why did anybody vote for Trump? Um, and the thing you wanna understand about Republican primaries is they're a very special universe. Um, they, Trump brought in new voters but something like 17%, that was 17% of the total, elect, total eligible electorate uh, in the end made it into Republican primaries. Um, and so we're not looking at anything like a representative sample of anything. When you poll these folks, you see a lot of things, right? 77% so oppose allowing Syrian, 66% say the access Hollywood video shouldn't matter, et cetera. I'm not gonna read that, you can read that. Um, and there isn't much support for free trade agreements, and there's a, a widespread beliefs against immigrants, and two-thirds of folks uh, say building a, favor building a wall with Mexico, including almost half of them say a great deal. This is not at all re representative of American general opinion. Anyway, so when we uh, try boiling down uh, this material, uh, what we found here um, what kinds of predictors would go for um, uh, predicting a Trump vote? Where we have one question is on the immigrants take jobs uh, situation with the build a Mexico wall. That's almost certain. These are very small samples. Only about 700 folks in the Republic, 644 I think, in the in the Republican primary. You're going to see multicollinearity, and thus we don't pay much attention to the sign on that immigrants take jobs thing. The basic story here is, is you hate, uh, it, this is a very strange gang of people. The, it, the uh, if favor, if none of them of course favor free trade. They want a strong leader, allow Syrian, no, they're totally opposed. Build a Mexico wall, they love it. Um, and then, um, yes, I will simply turn this over to Ben. Um, the, everything changes when you go to the national electorate. And the sort of big story here is the positions that Trump took in the primary often cost him in the general election. But the economic appeals that he made really did help him in the national election. Um, that we think we can document with all the qualifications and cautions that uh, we've already made. Thanks, Tom. Um, the point Tom made about the difference between the primary and general electorate is absolutely essential. If you think of the United States as demonstrating that there was a huge wave of right-wing populism, you're really referring to the primary election that nominated Donald Trump. When you get to the general election, one of the things you see right off from the slide that Tom left up here is sharp differences. As you go down those specifics, you see, yes, there's some social resentment, there's some cultural right-wing attitudes, there's some racism in the American electorate as a whole, but much less than in the Republican primary. And in fact, what's going on in the general election cannot be understood unless you understand that there were two unpopular candidates. Um, in terms of the Michigan 100 point, 100 degree, pardon me, feeling thermometer scale, Donald Trump was never popular. 
Before the election, his mean rating was 37 degrees. That's very chilly. 50 is sort of neutral, 100 is extremely warm. Hillary Clinton was 42, less than neutral. These were the two most unpopular candidates as a pair, probably in American history. We don't have surveys in the 19th century, but it's hard to think of another case. So what we're doing here is, when we look at the general election, simply looking at how did Trump get so close to a serious major party candidate as he got? Now, in studying general election voting, we did the same thing we did for the primaries, basically specified a big regression equation. It's sort of an ugly looking thing that Shannon may have a comment about, in which we entered a whole series of variables that you did not see um, for both the primary and the general election. We're only showing something that can be comprehended in a short period of time, and that's the significant coefficients. But basically, just about every factor we could find that was relevant theoretically to economic or social concerns is in there, plus a few others that obviously make a difference, like um, desire for a strong leader, or worry about weak, uh, weakness of the United States and in international affairs. Here are the general election results. Now, one more comment about how we set this up. We're interested in proximate effects of the attitudes that voters have in their minds when they go into the voting booth. So that the kind of thing you've been getting from earlier papers, from Shannon's work, um, is really more fundamental. That is, it talks about what's the stuff that led up to 2016. What we're trying to do is take individual level variations and um, see how they affect the vote. As you look at this, the coefficients look a lot like the primary coefficients. That is, you see big social, cultural factors there. For example, this amazing uh, notion that maybe Obama was Muslim, there's some racism there, there's some xenophobia. The, um, the um, notion that the Trump, the video, the Access Hollywood video of Trump engaging in sexist behavior, groping women and so forth, both boasting about it, um, that that shouldn't matter. You saw that that was a lot less, uh, people had a lot less sexist attitudes in the population as a whole than they did um, in the primary. But it still differentiated um, votes. So the first thing you see here is there are some big social factors. The second thing you should notice is that certain economic factors are more important than they were in the primaries. The third thing, though, is to remember that these coefficients are explaining variation in votes. They don't tell you who was gaining or who was losing, which depends on the mean, depends on the average responses to these questions. And as in the slide that Tom showed you, in the general electorate, Trump was not gaining from some of the things he gained from in the primary. For example, the Access Hollywood uh, tape. For example, Obama uh, suspicions that he's a Muslim. Very few people in the general electorate felt any very high level of doubt about that. Um, and likewise, the Access Hollywood tape, very few people thought this was a wonderful thing. Quite a few were worried about it. So Trump actually lost on a lot of those social issues. And then a final point to notice about the table is what's missing. There's some economic factors there, but the whole democratic advantage, the usual advantage that comes from taking progressive stands on social security, medical care, um, help with jobs, social welfare, liberalism, did not help the Democrats very much. There's a dog that did not bark. And the reason for that pretty clearly is that Trump inoculated himself to a large extent by saying he would protect social security and Medicare. On the other hand, Hillary Clinton, as she acknowledged in her, in her 
of what happened book did not do a good job of advocating for working class people and, uh, who had been in economic trouble. Um, so bottom, bottom line from all this is that in the primary election, social populism was indeed very important. In the general election, there's a, a lot more indication that economic left type populism was important, especially from what was missing, as opposed to um, the logistic coefficients you, you see there. So what, what we, we need to do next, the much more important, I think, part of this project is to bring together this work, this sort of micro level individual, what's in the voters' heads, with how did those things get into their heads? Why is it that you had this level of social resentment in the United States or in other places? And I think for that, we need to go back to the decades long economic stagnation, the destruction of communities, job losses, uncertainty, uh, and so forth of the sort that, um, that others have done a nice job of studying on the aggregate level. We need to merge that with these individual attitudes, figure out what the connections are between the two. Thank you. Well, we notice an interesting comparison and contrast between our three, pa three papers. On the one hand, each of our three papers dealing with each of our three nations uh, uh, focus on the uh, economically based narrative and provide ample confirmation for that. On the other hand, as in so many other things, there is an example of American exceptionalism. And that is, there is a part of the, Amer of the 2016 election uh, that uh, supports the social or cultural theory, theory. But that's because in America, we don't have an election, we have elections. And the primary elections in the United States are utterly unlike anything, perhaps in any other normal, uh, ordinary country. Uh, and that is where you can get the social come out because you get the proportion of the American population extremely small. And uh, Thomas uh, uh, Ferguson and Benjamin Page have eloquently uh, showed the general, which is economic, and then the American exceptional, the social, but under very peculiar American conditions. Now let's turn it over to our two discussants. And our first discussant will be Gustav Horn from the uh, Institute for the Study of Macroeconomic policy at the University of Dusseldorf. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the presentators for this uh, very interesting and especially very rich papers who have one question in common. Why? Why did they do that? We all are still stunned by the results of the recent elections and I think uh, we must try to explain it, how this could happen. Uh, there are all these examples you mentioned, and yesterday another example occurred, the Czech Republic also elected a populist government. But who are the populists? First of all, they have one thing in common, these parties. They distinguish between them and us. Them, that is an international elite that makes the decisions on globalization, on how we run our economy. Them. That's probably us here. And they have us. Us, that's the ordinary people who are exploited by these decisions. And they feel justified to make these kind of statements which are xenophobic, nationalistic, inappropriate, by justifying that's what ordinary people think. And that's legal to fight them these elites. And that's certainly a very dangerous situation for a society. And we must know what motives are present in these decisions these people take. We have commissioned a survey before the general German elections which tried to find these people who do that. It's difficult to find them. Because if you ask people on the streets, would you like to vote for Trump? Would you like to are you in favor of a Brexit? Uh, would you like to vote for the AfD? Many people don't say the truth. So they, our researchers used a specific sample in Germany. 
they used a sample of payback, payback card holders of a large retail uh, chain. And we know that these people in precarious jobs and precarious situations use payback cards because they get some money back if they make their, uh, their sales. And so we found these people uh, by using that sample. And what did they say? Why are they in favor of these kind of populist parties? The main reason was fear of loss of control. Not loss of control, but fear of loss of control. They had the general feeling that things get out of their hands. That reminds me of one result you presented in your last paper, wrong track. They have the feeling everything is on the wrong track. Everything is going wrong. But what is going wrong? They come to the other papers. And certainly trade is an issue. It's also an issue in Germany, you showed that. And uh, we know from other papers, the labor market papers, that outsourcing is one of the main reasons why wages come under pressure. German firms have outsourced a lot to Eastern Europe. And trade with Eastern Europe has increased dramatically during the past 10, 15 years. So this may be ex explain why you got your results, that trade exposure, importing exposure, and that is import exposure. If you outsource part of your firm, you get imports, and your employer, employer, um, employees are pressured by imports. And that could explain it to some extent. And think, get on the wrong track. Interestingly, one should assume that those who benefit from the outsourcing, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, where German FDI was very large, should then have another, make another decision. Interestingly, they make the same decisions. We have populist government, right-wing nationalistic government in Poland, in the Czech Republic, now in Hungary. There is a very strange conclusion that, or a very strange hypothesis. Who is benefiting from all that stuff? Obviously, many people have the feeling they are not benefiting from globalization. We have a lot of losers on both sides of the trade chain. And that's an issue I, as an economist, should deal with. Because in the past, we have all, always said in our lectures and have told all our students globalization is something everybody benefits from. It's no zero-sum game. And we all know David Ricardo's comparative advantages where everybody benefits from it. But we all know also Stolper Samuelson where not everybody benefits from it. So we have to think about it more, more closely. Where are, where are the losers? Why are people losing from trade? And that corroborates the view we have seen in another study in, on Germany uh, made by people from the German Marshall Fund. They said there are two conditions when populist parties will rise. The first one is there is a controversial debate on homeland security, crime, and so on. We had that in Germany in relation to refugees and some incidents we had there. That was the first, not very surprising. The second, maybe more surprising precondition is there is no controversial debate about economic policy. Then people got the feeling, all these guys are not protecting me and my interests. They're distributing the perks of economy among themselves. It's them, the elites, who get that. And I must say, that was the situation we have in Germany. The big parties had no economic policy quarrels with each other. They were all in favor of globalization, they were all in favor of deregulating financial markets 10 years ago. There was no big controversy as it was in earlier decades. And that's certainly, so certainly both prerequisites were fulfilled in Germany already. And that's something which is very worrying and I think which gives us a lot of things to, food for thinking uh, about what we do with globalization if we have to change things in globalization. I think still it's valid an economy benefits from globalization. Both economies trading benefit.
but we must discuss much more stronger the distribution of wealth within the economy. We had another survey in Germany made during the election on, based on exit polls by the election. My institute is related to the German trade unions and we wanted to know, does trade union membership protect you from voting for the AfD? The result was that 15% of trade union members voted for the AfD, which is above the average. Controlling for social status and other variables, it, the number shrank to the average. So the answer is no. Even trade union membership does not protect you from voting for populist parties because some of the labor force, being a member of the trade union, also has this kind of input pressure. The firm is endangered. There has been outsourcing. People feel that their needs have not been taken into account properly. If you talk to these people, they tell you, first of all, they say they complain about the refugees coming in, threatening security, and so on. After three or four minutes, they say, you spend such a lot of money on refugees, and when I looking at my pension, it is cut. Looking at the local hospital, it's closed. Looking at the local post office, it is closed. You do not consider my interest. And that's the reason why they voted for these kind of parties that promised to change everything without, without providing any, any sensible solutions. I mean, that's also a common feature of these parties. Trump has no sensible solutions to everything, I think, or every another one. Uh, the Brexiteers, I mean, nobody knows in the UK how to make a Brexit. And uh, up to today, and the clock is ticking. So let's wait and see what's going to happen. And in Germany, uh, the AfD does not explain how she will change things. She's just against the status quo. And I think that's also a common feature of the populists. So what have we had to do? We have to present answers to the needs of these people because the number is so big. These people are our neighbors, our colleagues, our children, our parents. We have to take care of their needs and convince them that there are better solutions than these parties provide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're beginning to notice that present on our panel today uh, and haunting our entire discussion is the famous precariat that we heard about so eloquently yesterday uh, from Guy Standing. And then we also had those very important comments by Shannon Manat yesterday at the same occasion. And now we have uh, look forward to her again and making comments on what we've been hearing about today. Shannon. Thank you, and apologies to those of you who were here yesterday for the dual uh, economy discussion because there's going to be some overlap. And that's necessary because I don't think that you can talk about populist revolts without talking about dualism. They're just so tightly connected. So um, I wanted to talk about the common themes across these three papers and then provide a little bit of context from, for some examples from the US. Um, one of the major themes, of course, is that the factors that are driving revolts across all kinds of different countries are inherently economic, and we saw that across the gamut of the three papers. Uh, Timo talked about the role of education, the historical dependence on manufacturing, income, unemployment, uh, and also he mentioned well-being and life satisfaction, which I think is an important component tied to all of these. Uh, and then Gold discussed the uh, relationship between the formation of extreme right parties in regions that are facing more import competition. And so there's this inherent economic component to this as well. Uh, and an another important point or theme through these papers is that this just didn't happen all of a sudden and it wasn't just a recession effect that uh, what we're seeing now with populism and voting patterns is that it's a result of a buildup over several decades of economic, social, and even family decline. Uh, and then Tom discussed the role of, of racial resentment, uh, Tom and Ben, and importantly noted that the role that, that racial resentment played may have been different in the Republican primaries and in the overall election. Now we often think of these, these economic explanations and these racial cultural explanations as though they're competing, and I don't think that that necessarily is the case. Uh, in fact, sociologists have long noted 
that those in positions of power use a divide and conquer strategy to separate the white working class from working class folks of color, and that is in their best interest to do so because then we won't all rise up against, uh, against the man to fight for our common interests. Um, and we see examples of this throughout history in the US where blacks were used as, as strike breakers, of course, uh, to get whites to come back to work. Okay, so that brings me to a discussion on the role of the rural revolt in the US. There was some discussion of rural urban differences uh, in some of these papers and the important role that place played in all of this. So shortly after the election, woohoo, rural areas finally get some attention, right? Like one of the problems is politicians and the media in the US uh, especially neglect the role of rural people in places. So a series of editorials came out about, you know, was this a rural revolt, rural people fighting back? Um, and it, there was a lot of discussion about this and how it must be true for a really long time. Uh, so I'm gonna get to that in the role of rural people in a minute, but I wanted to point out that how we think about rural people in places in the US really matters a lot for how those people in places think about uh, urban elites and politicians. And so this is a Brookings report that came out shortly after the election that compared Trump and Clinton's vote shares across high output and low output America. That was the title. And what low output really was was a proxy for rural. And it was based entirely on, on GDP, arguing that urban areas in the US produce most GDP, and therefore they voted for the good candidate, and the rural people, they don't produce anything, but they voted for the bad candidate. Uh, and what headlines like this do is really undervalue a lot of the um, products and services that rural areas provide to urban areas. Urban areas have to rely on rural areas in the US for food, energy, uh, recreation destinations, retirement destinations increasingly. Uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, prisoners and trash also get sent to rural areas. So these are things that high output America can't live without. Uh, and headlines like this just make rural people, uh, who I know, dig in their heels and say, see, I knew these people didn't like us. They think that they're better than us, and we're just going to watch everything blow up, watch them figure that out. OK, so then, was there really a rural revolt in the US? Well, to be sure, uh, Donald Trump received a much larger share of the rural vote than Hillary Clinton did. And the uh, Trump's share of the vote increased with increasing levels of virality. But this isn't new. Rural areas have, also, have always gone strongly for Republican candidates. They went slightly more strongly for Trump than they did for Mitt Romney in the 2012 election. But look, rural voters only make up about 15% of the whole US population and about a similar share of the total, uh, total vote. Um, I think it really matters whether the question that we're asking is, where did Trump perform well? Who, what voters did Trump win? Versus the question that we're asking is, what were the difference makers? Okay, because Republicans tend to win certain types of demographics. But what really mattered here were key difference makers, key places that swung the election to Trump. And so when we think about what those places were, uh, the dark purple are the counties where Trump overperformed relative to the last Republican candidate, Mitt Romney, uh, to hold kind of that Republican sentiment at a baseline. And we see here that it's this band uh, spanning from the industrial Midwest up through the Northeast into New England. And of course, what we need to remember is that Trump actually lost the national vote by nearly three million votes, okay? And uh, he actually performed worse than Mitt Romney did in terms of an overall share of the votes. So it wasn't like Americans all of a sudden just said, oh, that, let's you know, vote for this new guy. It was that because we have an electoral-based system uh, and one vote doesn't equal one vote <laughs> in the US, uh, what we end up with is that some places matter much more than others to election outcomes. And in this last election, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, and Pennsylvania mattered more than other places. Now, if we compare Trump's overperformance to economic distress uh, measured on a variety of different variables, what we see is tremendous amount of overlap. And in fact, the places that Trump overperformed the most are places that have experienced significant economic decline since 2000. And you can even go back to 1980s, and it would be the same places that have experienced significant economic decline since 1980s. 
These places aren't just bad off economically. These are places that have experienced major increases in drug-related mortality. Spatial clustering of these relationships uh, really mattered for the election. So for instance, in the industrial Midwest, counties that had higher drug alcohol and suicide mortality rates uh, also are places where Trump overperformed the most. But it's not just drugs. All-cause mortality has been increasing in non-metro areas, but also medium and small metro areas, which is part of the conversation that's often left out. Um, life expectancy has, has increased, and mortality has not, uh, not increased uh, in the largest urban areas of the US, and that's, of course, where most of the income gains have gone uh, since the recession, even since 1980. So as I mentioned, it's not just drug, uh, issues, it's not just economic issues, it's a wide gamut of economic distress that were pointed out in these three papers, a sentiment that people feel like things are going worse than before for a variety of different reasons, whether it be trade uh, or whether it be um, unemployment, declining wages. Across all of these categories of distress, economic, health, family, distress, Trump performed best in places that were in the highest quartile of that distress. So we can't... Uh, we can't underestimate the role that distress in general played in this election. And of course, these types of distress are highly spatially clustered, right? So places that have high economic distress also have high family distress, high divorce rates, single parent families, for instance, and they have less access to social capital promoting institutions. So the economic, the family, the social all work together um, to create a context in which a lot of folks feel like things are not going so well and that they haven't been going so well for a while. Some of these ideas come out in some important books that if you haven't read already, I highly recommend. Sam Quinones wrote this book, Dreamland, uh, about the history of the opioid epidemic and how it came to be so problematic in the places it's problematic in right now. And he, ta he writes like a sociologist, even though he's a journalist. He talks about economic and economics and marketing and how drug companies targeted places that had declining economic conditions and a large supply of manual laborers. Uh, of course, J.D. Vance uh, is pretty well known now in the U.S. for his commentary on uh, these lost and taken for granted places um, that have experienced decline in this sense that people there are more pessimistic. So if you look at polling, what you see is that uh, pessimism, the feeling that you're doing much worse than your parents, uh, has increased among working class whites, and it's, pr it's stayed pretty stable among working class blacks and Hispanics. Uh, and so that's an important component to all of this. The people living in these places, whites especially living in these places, see that their economic conditions are far worse than those from previous generations. And then, of course, Arlie Hochschild wrote Strangers in Her Own Land, uh, where she talked to Trump supporters and everybody she talked to felt like they were on shaky economic grounds. So when you're in these places and you're driving by old shuttered factories, you're driving by needles laying in the road, your neighbors, you keep hearing about overdoses, you see more of your neighbors on disability rather than working, it feels like America is not so great. And many of these places just wanted a change. Uh, and then finally, we can't underestimate the role of social capital here. In Glass House, Brian Alexander talks about what happened at the Anchor Hawking Glass Company uh, in Lancaster, Ohio, and how it wasn't just, so private equity firms came in, and when they did that, they removed the CEOs that were local to the area who interacted with residents, and they replaced them with people that nobody knew, and they sent them to live off in the suburbs where they didn't interact with the community. And this led to some social decline in this area where people no longer felt connected to the businesses that were there. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop right here and we can talk about some of these things later. Just one point, it's not just the economy. Everything is wrapped up in the economy. And so when that goes down, racial resentment increases, social distress increases, and family breakdown increases. Thank you very much for that very eloquent uh, summary and conclusion. Mm -hmm. Now what we have witnessed today is a great counter assault of the economic theory against the social and cultural theory. That is, say, a great assault of what might be called the INET insurgents against the conventional establishment as we see it in the various institutions, including academia and the media. Do not, however, assume that there will not be a counter-counter assault. 
That is to say, the establishment people and their theorists can take everything we've heard today, which is absolutely true and persuasive, and then begin to turn it into their own uh, particular formulation. And that is this. Uh, we have shown how the economic distress has become an extremely powerful explanation and can largely capture almost the, all the fascinating uh, political phenomena of 2016 and of recent years. However, notice that the economic uh, theory has the people who, of course, left behind, uh, who are low output in the language of the establishment. And so this means the people who Hillary Clinton called socially and culturally the deplorable can now be reinterpreted by the establishment as being economically expendable. Ah, but then, of course, this leads to the social pathology that is so poignant and so uh, beautifully and uh, described by Shannon. Ah, but I have talked to establishment people or people who benefit from the establishment and their interpretation of these people. I've talked to them about the books that they have read that Shannon has, uh, that, we, that, that we have read together, that Shannon emphasized, like J.D. Vance. And instead of uh, sympathizing with the people that are described so eloquent by Shannon in these books, they say, oh, but these people are so different from we than we are. It's not just a dual economy. It's not just a dual uh, psychology. It's a dual pathology and a du uh, two nations. And therefore, these people are not only deplorable, they're not only expendable, but they will become despicable. That, I think, is the dark future uh, the growing division in the United States. Those of you from other countries may see something similar. Anyway, we do have some time for questions from the audience, and I suppose in keeping with our uh, uh, shift from politics from one side to the other, I'll begin from what is the audience's point of view uh, from the, uh, from the uh, it would be the left side. Any questions over here? No, oh, apparently not. So I, I gather yeah, the left is right uh, there, speechless so. after our, oh, yes, please. Uh, uh, the microphone? Do you see any alternative? <laughs> so some very interesting talks and some very interesting evidence. So Mirko Draka from Warwick University. So, what I'm wondering is that, you know, all of the evidence that you showed indicated that this stuff has been at play for a long time, right? And it's been developing, these are structural trends in the economy across countries that have developed over a long time. So what I'm wondering is, why did it all happen in 2016, right? And the hypothesis I'd like to put forward is that it's, you know, could it be something to do with the technology? Of, okay, so it's either a critical mass hypothesis of it's been building up for a lot, long time and it reached uh, some type, type of tipping point, or is it something to do with the change in the kind of landscape of political communication in the media, right? That uh, these insurgent f populist political forces are now able to tap into uh, the political sentiments that have been driven by these long-term economic trends. Oh, that's a very elegant formulation. I say, again, we have two competing theories, a long-term uh, build-up, and what by, at a certain point, the quantitative change becomes the qualitative change, the critical mass. Uh, but then we have something that would be technologically based, the advent of the uh, new social media of the information age, the post-industrial age, have then enabled people to have a participation that hitherto they had not had. Uh, the social media give voice to people who hitherto had been voiceless. So let's hear some of our people here. And I see we have some excited hands coming up from the center of the, uh, that is say, from America. So yes, quick, Benjamin quick Page. comment about the U.S. case. I, I would add to those hypotheses uh, the idiosyncratic nature of the Trump candidacy. Trump's personal wealth made it possible for him to essentially break open the Republican Party orthodoxy. And beyond what we've talked about today, one of the things that's happened in the United States is essentially the Republican Party is falling apart. Unfortunately, the Democratic Party is in big trouble too. Um, but Trump was able to defuse the, the left populism of Bernie Sanders, of uh, many Democrats, by saying he would protect Social Security and Medicare and so forth. 
Um, yeah, so that's very important. Yes, uh, uh, Robert, so, Robert, Robert Lane. Yeah, uh, so social media certainly played a role, uh, I think. So that's very apparent. There's evidence for the US that, um, that, that uh, social media were very important for distributing those, what is called fake news, and that it's particularly Trump that benefited from it. We know from Brexit that uh, Twitter bots played a role in uh, the running up uh, for, for the referendum and that uh, the exit voters were more affected from that. Uh, still, I think we need some more research to really pin down uh, exactly the role of social media, but I'm very much, uh, yes, uh, certainly, but, but, but I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure that it uh, does play a role. Another issue which does not exactly explain why it happened in this specific year, but I think what we saw today is that there's two strands of uh, explanations uh, for the rise of populism. The one is the more, economic channel that does play a role and it's important to know that it's not only ideology that drives people but there are real reasons for them to uh, vote for the populist parties and there's more this uh, socio socio-economic and cultural uh, issues that do play a role and I think the interaction of both uh, things have become more important on the one hand because the populist parties have become better in exploiting these interactions and linking things so linking uh, cultural deprivation and whatsoever fears anxiety to economic uh, issues and because people uh, are also increasingly driven by exactly this uh, anxiety towards the future I think we don't understand the interaction between both uh, factors uh, well enough at the very moment. Uh, but there is one, and I think this might explain why populism has become such a widespread uh, phenomenon in recent years. Not the one uh, and not the other, but the interaction of both uh, mechanisms. Well, it does appear that our time is up. Uh, and so I'm glad that we had this very important question at the very end and, and then two variations on it. Uh, I, I do see Tom, who after all is the boss of all things, uh, uh, I do see you having your hand up, so perhaps you can make a closing comment. Yeah, just simply, uh, my colleagues and I, tomorrow, or tomorrow on the Money and Politics paper, maybe it's Monday, um, directly address the question of timing. There's not much doubt at all that if you're looking for national uh, results, national effects, changing patterns of political investment. As Ben said, you get a change in the Republican Party because you had a billionaire walk in who could just laugh at all the others. Um, and then in the Democratic Party, you got the Sanders phenomenon. But let's not get carried away with the social media story. This stuff was going on, and your papers show it, long before social media got rolling. And it also turns out when you look that the older folks who are catching the right populism, because we didn't have any discussion of Bernie Sanders and Mélenchon today. But if you catch the folks who catch the right populism are generally the least involved in social media. They're the ones who can't download an app to save their life. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>